thank you everyone for uh, for joining and uh, big thanks to to jason for uh, um for being a guest in, uh, in this webinar we've done a lot of great work with him uh, um over the past several months i would say several years by now and uh, today we're extremely excited to to show you what we we've got of course norman our vp of geospatial is going to give you a ton of uh uh, demos that uh, he put together. So uh, I will start with a small presentation about our team, what you can do with TalDB, why you would choose TalDB to store, manage, and process uh, SAR and LiDAR data. This data is fundamentally different, and yet we unify it um, in TalDB. So you're gonna hopefully this is gonna make a lot of sense um, as we go through with the with the webinar. Then I'm gonna turn it over to Jason, of course, to um, to describe what SAR is in more detail and uh, of course present uh, the, the exciting company Capella Space. And finally, Norman is gonna take over the, the technical part of the uh, of the webinar and show you a lot of demos. Okay, so with that, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so the, the webinar today is about uh, analyzing LiDAR and SAR data with Capella Space and TalDB. Um, a few things about who TalDB is uh, for those that uh, haven't been in uh, in another of our webinars and uh, doesn't know us. Um, TalDB is a research project that I had started uh, a while ago, back in 2000, 2014 to 2017, uh, when I was at MIT and Interlabs. Um, the project itself has deep roots at the intersection of high performance computing databases and data science. Uh, we've raised over $20 million from uh, from amazing investors. We have some amazing strategic partners, like, for example, Lockheed Martin, who, who is using us for, for geospatial data. Um, over 45 members uh, team and we're growing. And one of the of the big differences of our uh, company versus other database companies is that in addition to, of course, the data management and software engineering ex expertise that we bring, um, we uh, we have members in our team that are experts across the domains uh, that we delve into. And of course, Geospatial, Norman is one of them and his team. So deep expertise in the verticals that we're, uh, we're dealing with. We have a lot of traction across the board. We don't do just geospatial. We do a lot of uh, health, life, uh, health and life sciences, a lot of telecommunications, uh, uh, traditional time series, and more. So here is the general problem we're solving. You're going to see why this is extremely relevant to what we do with SAR and, and LiDAR. We, are, we have a foundational solution, so I want to give you a deep understanding of you know, how we're solving this at a fundamental level. We're not just hacking SAR and LiDAR into a database. We take a foundational approach to data management, and that gives us the power to, to manage these very different uh, data types. So what we see is, um, and we have talked to hundreds, by now hundred or hundreds of organizations, uh, there is a common theme across them. They're drowning in, in the data infrastructure mess. The problem is that it's very difficult to handle data that goes beyond tables in SQL. There are hundreds or thousands of databases that deal with tables in SQL. That's not the problem. The problem starts when the data goes, it becomes very, very different to just tabular data and you can't fit it into a traditional relational database. Um, this gives rise to way too many domain specific file formats. Um, for the geospatial experts uh, on the webinar, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But also we have very diverse audience. We have some bioinformatics people joining us as well. And the same theme is prevalent in bioinformatics as well and many many other domains um, that leads to overly complex metadata handling and data sharing because effectively what you have is a bunch of files stored in a bucket so just, just making sense of what these files are is is a very big uh, um, very big hurdle um, you end up um, ha you know buying multiple solutions from multiple vendors and because most of those solutions cannot fit your problems you of course build a ton of solutions in-house and we see a lot of similarity across the solutions that different organizations are building we're seeing the same thing being built again and again um, and finally it's extremely difficult to govern all this data holistically because yes a, a relational database is very good at governing relational tables but what happens to the flat files to you know raster data imaging lidar genomics and so on and so forth you, you need another way to govern this data holistically so the end effect is very low productivity for data analysts and scientists they end up using way too many systems wrangling data from one system to another and so on and so forth and a huge total cost of ownership and operations for organizations because they need to buy all those all those tools then spend a lot of time with their engineers on making sense of those tools and so on and so forth so what is the solution we came up with um 
we coin it the universal database and by universal we mean all the data um, again this is going to make sense in a couple of slides um, and not just all we don't just handle all the data we do it extremely fast and therefore very economically um, so TileDB is a solution that allows you to securely manage all your data assets and um, boost anything you do around analytics, data science, and machine learning. So across all of those disciplines. These are the four pillars of TileDB, which I'm going to explain in this slide. So first of all, uh, TileDB allows you to store in one place all your data, and this spans uh, across tables, files, images, video, LiDAR, genomics, ML features, dashboards, metadata, you just name it, like all of the data. Um, the second thing which is extremely important is performance, and TileDB has a way to tailor its internal mechanics to the application, and that this is what makes TileDB extremely fast for any domain, right? We don't customize for a domain, we just tune tune the, the schema. That's all you need to know for now. You can understand the data structure we're using in a bit. The third thing is that you can do a lot of different things with TileDB. It's not just SQL. It's not just some domain-specific language. You can do analytics with SQL if you want to, but you can do also um, uh, you know, more data science and machine learning uh, workloads that just don't, don't fit in, in a traditional database. And finally, exactly because we manage all the data, you have the ability to holistically govern everything, which means you, you can monitor all activity with logging and uh, you can apply uh, authentication and access control across the board without having to use multiple different systems. So what is the secret sauce? That TileDB sounds like the holy grail of data management. So is it, is it even feasible to come up with, with such a solution? So after several years working on this, we we can now prove uh, legitimately that this is possible and we, we pull it off. The, the secret sauce is this data structure. So instead of storing the data as flat files in a custom domain specific format, uh, instead of storing the data in, uh, in tables or key values or documents and so on and so forth, we store the data in this mathematical structure, the multidimensional array, which comes in two flavors, dense, where you know, every every cell here uh, has a value. You can have as many dimensions as you want. You can store as many different values of different types within each cell. You can have arbitrary key value metadata attached. And then you have the sparse arrays, which is very similar to dense with the uh, difference that the majority of those cells may be empty, but also the dimensions may be infinite. You may have a real dimension here, you may have a string dimension here. No problem, the sparse array can handle this. So the majority of the cells can be empty and you may even have multiplicities for, for those cells. So we abuse a little bit the, um, the terminology of the array, but th this little, this slight modification um, gives us the universality that we need. Um, just as a, as a sneak peek, um, in a dense array, we store SAR data and in a sparse array, we store LiDAR data. And ju just this proves to you that we can handle this extremely efficiently with a single data structure, single API. Uh, for those uh, curious, arrays subsume even data frames at a fun fundamental level. Again, this is not just a TALIB artifact, this is an array artifact. And just very quickly, I can tell you that, you know, a, a data frame can be a bunch of columns, so we can store it as a bunch of vectors, or we can take any subset of those columns and create the dimensions around those and treat the tuples as sparse points in a sparse domain. That gives you rapid slicing on the dimensions, or you can use this trick to, to have label dimensions. I'm not going to get into details about this. We have a lot of materials online just on the format and um, many more tutorials are coming up on, on data frames. Just a little bit of piece of information here. Arrays do subsume data frames. There is nothing that tabular data the, the databases can do that TalDB or any other array system implementing those dense and sparse arrays cannot. So uh, exactly because of this data structure, we have a, we are tackling a lot of different applications. Again, LiDAR and SAR are two of those, but we do a ton of others like population genomics, single cell, biomedical imaging, and many, many more. Again, if you're interested in, if, and if you have a use case that you, you feel that TalDB can capture, just, just send us an email. So how did we build this universal database? Starting to get slightly uh, technical before, uh, before the handover to to Jason, so at the very bottom, imagine any kind of file system, as long as it is you know, globally addressable by multiple machines, you're good. Um, an example is AWS S3 or 
Google, Google Cloud Storage or Azure Blob Storage, but it could be any other object store like MinIO, could be Luster, a powerful distributed file system, could be Hadoop, it could be even your laptop and your RAM. So any kind of backend, okay? And then at the very top, imagine that you have any kind of language with native APIs, for example, Python using NumPy arrays and pandas, right? As natively as we can be, as native as we can be. And then on top of this, we can uh, integrate with machine learning tools like TensorFlow, for example, in PyTorch. We have integrations with MariaDB and Presto for SQL. We have integrations with distributed com computing platforms like Dask and Spark, but also applications, uh, uh, especially today, um, Norman is going to show you integrations with PDAL and, and GDAL. And then in the middle, we have the actual offerings. We have TalDB embedded, which is absolutely open source. A lot of the stuff that Norman is going to show you today is open source. Uh, and this is the storage engine. It's a C++ library built for performance. And then TalDB Cloud is the actual database. It's, it's an elastic uh, computation platform that does also access control and logging. It's completely serverless from the, from the user's point of view. You can spin up Jupyter notebooks and dashboards and many other good things. Again, we have a lot of materials online that this is not the purpose of, of this webinar. I just want you to see the, the software stack. So a few things about the, the two uh, offerings. So for TalDB Embedded, it's super performant. It's built in C++. We use vectorization, multi-threading. It's a columnar format, uh, very similar to Parquet, but it goes way beyond uh, Parquet's uh, uh, capabilities. We use R trees for indexing, for sparse arrays, and many, many more. Um, we have rapid updates and data versioning, so we do immutable writes. This gives, gives us the cloud native capabilities that we have. It's lock free so we can do ingestion while reading. We have versioning and time traveling. All of this is built into the open source storage engine and format. You don't need an extra piece of software to enjoy these, these features. Also, it's uh, extremely interoperable. We have all those APIs and integrations with tools. And finally, and extremely importantly for this webinar, it is super optimized for the cloud. Again, we, we use the low-level SDKs of AWS S3 or from Google Cloud storage and uh, Azure Blob storage. We are uh, uh, considering all the peculiarities of the, of the object stores, like object immutability, the fact that it is expensive to list files and so on and so forth. So we, we go to the extreme uh, with both our format as well as our storage engine to make absolutely certain that TalDB performs excellent on, um, on cloud object stores. Now, TalDB Cloud is a platform. So in addition to the storage engine that it uses, you know, it assumes that you're storing your data in some cloud object store uh, for now AWS S3. And then TalDB manages the compute. So it's elastic. It has task graphs. It has a lot of good things there. Again, everything serverless. And it can work anywhere. Um, Norman is going to show you our SaaS offering on cloud.taldb.com. But this is sold with a license on premises as well. Um, it is completely serverless, as I mentioned. You can do slicing, SQL, user-defined functions, task graphs, like a lot of capabilities there. You can launch Jupyter Notebooks, which is what most of you are doing anyway, so you can do it inside the platform. You don't need to set up another server for that. It is geo-aware, especially if, you're, if you have GDPR compliance and stuff like that. Like TalDB Cloud recognizes which bucket your data is in. And then it sends the compute to a cluster that we, we are operating in this bucket. So you don't need to think about egress and, and, and stuff like that. It's secure. We're undergoing compliance, penetration tests, and all of that. But one of the biggest takeaways for, for TalDB Cloud is that we treat everything as an array. So in addition to all the types of data, we even store Jupyter Notebooks as arrays. We're storing code as arrays, user-defined function and task graphs, machine learning models, dashboards. Pretty much anything is stored as an array, and that allows us to uh, make everything shareable, right, at global scale, and everything logged, everything, even if you spin up a Jupyter notebook, we know you accessed it, we log it. The same happens with the user-defined function, if you call it, and everything is monetizable. Like, we have a full-fledged marketplace um, set up on TalDB Cloud, in integrated with Stripe. You can sell code and data uh, based on usage or any other model you prefer. So getting a little bit more, so that, that, that's it about the, uh, the offerings. Now let's, let's uh, try to understand a little bit why SAR and LiDAR uh, are perfect fit for TalDB or TalDB is a perfect fit for SAR and LiDAR. So SAR in our world is a, you know, each, each image is a two-dimensional array, uh, which 
optionally, optionally can be stacked across time. So we can create 3D cubes effectively where the dimensions are width, height, and time. Of course, you can incorporate as many as, as you want, but this array gives you a rapid performance for slicing across the dimensions, like for a particular time interval and for a particular slice in, in the geospatial axis. So rapid slicing, we have you know internal indexes that does this kind of indirectly. I'm going to show you a slide about this. But the fact that RDB stores natively those dense arrays is what gives you performance for SAR. So it's cloud native, as I mentioned. There is versioning and time traveling. This is important for reproducibility. If you make errors, you're going to go back and see what happened. So all of this is handled by, by the storage engine. And we integrate with GDAL, which is what allows us to, to go from, you know, ingest COGS, for example, into TALDB arrays. So you don't need to create your own ingestors. GDAL knows perfectly well pretty much all the formats out there for imaging. And we can, we can just utilize it to store the data with a single command into TALDB, into TALDB arrays. And of course, we have a lot of visualization capabilities. These are parts of, you know, they can be widgets, for example, on the Jupyter notebooks. Norman is going to show you a lot of cool stuff that we've done there. So LiDAR, similarly, is an array. The, the, the data is an array. But in this case, there are 3D points in space, so there are 3D sparse arrays. So you can do native float indexing. For example, if A is an array you open, you see you can, you can just slice in terms of floats here because we are storing floats as dimensions and that presents zero problems with TALDB arrays. These are sparse arrays. You can slice like this super natively. You don't need extra metadata as long as you have projected the, the data appropriately and you keep a huge array um, with all your data there. You can just slice natively in, in the native uh, geospatial coordinates. Of course, you can be as creative as you want, but this is an option for you. So we have efficient indexing through our trees. Uh, of course, it's cloud native. That's extremely important. It's cloud native by, by default. You don't need to do anything. No code changes when you go from local to the cloud. You just change the, the name of the array and it just works. Versioning and, and time traveling, as mentioned before, and even schema evolution, because sometimes you, 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 know, you produce or you ingest the original LiDAR data, but then you want to add labels. Well, the labels could be an extra attribute. You evolve the schema, you add an attribute, and you're all set. You don't need to recreate the whole, the whole data set. And here we have also integration with PDL and PCL. And this is what gives us, you know, the rapid ingestion. You, again, Norman is going to cover all of that when, when it comes to, to any kind of ETL with, uh, with point clouds and, and TALDB. Um, and finally, of course, visualization capabilities. So the reason why we're so rapid, in addition to all, you know, the sophistication in the format, lies in indexing dense and sparse arrays. So for dense arrays, it is implicit. So if I know the tiling, so TALDB, tiles the data and compresses. So if, if I just know that, hey, I wrote in this particular subspace of the domain and I know the tiling and I have a slice, well, I know that because these are two by two tiles and I know the order of the tiles, I know here that I'm looking for the second and the fourth tile. And because I know the size of the tile, these are dense arrays with minimal metadata in the scheme, in, in the array uh, format, I can just slice those tiles from the disk in parallel using the SDK extremely efficiently and so on and so forth. So this is what gives us the performance for the dense case. And for the sparse case, we use our trees. So the points get grouped into MBRs, these minimum bounding rectangles. After sorting, for example, on Hilbert order, you have a lot of options there in terms of ordering. And then bottom up, you group those MBRs, and that's how you create an R tree. And this gives you uh, amazing opportunities for slicing and pruning extremely fast uh, this point cloud data. So this is the last slide. So in addition, so now that you have brought, assuming that you have brought your SAR, SAR and LiDAR data into the TALDB platform, um, all these opportunities to do advanced analytics and machine learning are opening up. And machine learning is one of the things you can do. So for example, in, in a single platform without wrangling, just with a common API, you can slice some SAR data, you can slice some LiDAR data, and you can superimpose, you can co-register, you can color, you can classify, you can do all of those cool things. We have tight integrations with TensorFlow and PyTorch. This is the topic of another webinar where uh, we're preparing. You can store the, the produced machine learning models after training them on TALDB Cloud and share them and access control them and so on and so forth. And the, the takeaway here is that TALDB Cloud just gives you a full-fledged platform for all of exploration, analytics, and machine learning.
So that's it from me. Um, very happy to answer questions later, and of course, uh, reach out to us anytime. But uh, um, with that, I would like to hand it over to, to Jason uh, to present Ka Capella Space and the work he's doing there. Thanks so much, Stavros. All right, so as Stavros mentioned, my name is Jason Brown, I'm from Capella Space. And we have synthetic aperture radar. So we'll talk a little bit about what that is and what that means. But what is the advantage of SAR? Synthetic aperture radar can see through clouds, dust, smoke, ash. So, and it's an active system, which means it provides its own electromagnetic radiation. So it can see at night, whereas optical can't. So it's a complementary uh, data source to optical data. At Capella, we're changing access to how Earth information is gained, all right? We have frequent revisit, so high cadence. You can look at the same spot on the ground several times. Of course, as I mentioned, any time, any weather, so day or night through um, clouds and smoke or ash. We have very high resolution imaging, half a meter for our best. Um, and we'll look at some of the examples of those. And then uh, we have very low latency. So from the time that you order or task uh, an image to the delivery, it's very, very quick. Here's some details. Um, if you know anything about uh, imaging radar, this would mean some stuff to you. The takeaway from this slide is the imaging modes and imagery products. All right, spotlight, sliding spotlight, and strip map. We'll talk about each of those uh, here in a moment. But first, let's talk about what is synthetic aperture radar? Ultimately, synthetic aperture radar is a ranging measurement. It turns out that we can create an image that looks very similar to um, a panchromatic or black and white image that you might get from an optical satellite, uh, but it is done with ranging because radar is radio detection and ranging. So it's very similar to uh, speed detection um, using radar or lasers. Um, uh, sonar and um, uh, ultrasounds. All right, you can do it with sound and electromagnetic waves, and that's where we fit in. We use radio frequency to do this. All right, I mentioned what is it? What is it measuring? It measures it, the detection and the range. So. The detection is the backscattered signal uh, from things on the ground. A radar transmits a pulse from the satellite and then measures the time that it takes to come back. So that's the range part. And then different things have different brightness of backscatter. All right, I mentioned we would talk about our imagery products. You can see uh, footprints on the left-hand side here of uh, our spot site or sliding spotlight and strip map products. So for an uh, increasing resolution, um, our lowest resolution is about 1.2 meters GSD, right? A pixel on the ground is about 1.2 meters and you get a five kilometer by 20 kilometer footprint. Next is about one meter GSD or pixel size on the ground at five kilometers by 10 kilometers footprint. And then our very high resolution or highest resolution is about a half a meter pixel size. And the footprint on the ground is a five kilometer by five kilometer square. forgot to mention also that LIDAR is also a ranging instrument um, and works similar to SAR uh, with the exception that it builds 
point clouds rather than an image. And that's that sparse data set that Stavros was talking about and uh, that Norman will show us a little bit later. All right, here's a comparison of our imagery product, our imagery products. You can see our spot, spot, site, and strip map. Okay, and they have uh, increasing image quality as the resolution gets better. All right, um, to access our data, we have a couple different methods. Um, we have an intuitive and easy to use GUI that you can um, get over the web. <clears throat> we call it the Capella console. And you can search and download uh, imagery from the archive as well as task. Tasking um, is done from your laptop. Very simple, very easy, very quick. Additionally, um, if you wanted to do machine to machine, uh, Capella has an API. Uh, so you can also tip and queue using this API. <clears throat> so if you have uh, some kind of existing system that uh, gives notification, earthquakes, volcanoes, et cetera, um, you can do machine to machine to cause the Capella system to task a, uh, an image of an event that was tipped by some other system, some other notification system. And of course, you can do all the other standard things um, from in the API that you could do in the console. So you can search, download, and um, put in tasking requests. All right, and that is it for me. I think I'm gonna hand it over to Norman now for the demonstration. Great, thank you, Jason. I'm just gonna share my screen. So before we get started, I just wanna say thank you to Jason and to Kapana for sharing the data with us. And I also like to thank uh, Marguerite and Vicky and Jason for working on these demos with me. And also to Harold Butler and the Poodle team for providing the label point cloud data set we're gonna use in this demonstration. So here we're logged into the CloudDB cloud, as Staff was saying, it's a SaaS platform. And we actually have other webinars and documentation on how to use CloudDB cloud. So I'm just gonna go over this fairly quickly. So here, here's the first page you see when you log in. If you look at Compare's open data, you see we have 219 of those there from Compare. And we're actually going to look at the schemas and then some of the access and some of the logging for each particular of those. So in this case, we're looking at the point cloud data set. This is the labeled point cloud. You can see here's the tile to be URI that used to access the data. And here's the location on S3. Let's have a quick look at the schema. So we have dimensions here of X, Y, and Z. And then we have the standard attributes you'd expect to see. And each one of these are compressed differently so you can optimize your storage. And we also log all activity. As you can see, I've been doing a bunch of reads and queries. And we can also share this with other people. So we can share within an organization or we can invite them using their email. Do the same thing here for the uh, dense array. So the dense array is the SAR stack in this case. You can see here, here's the URI that we use to access the data. It's stored in S3. It's about two gigabytes in size. I'm gonna show you how we created this array using both time as a dimension and also the time traveling feature inside TileDB. We have a look at the schema. We made this schema uh, GDAO accessible, but you can change the schema to be anything you want. So we're using X, Y, and buttons, and we can see here the values are compressed using C standard. Again, you can do the sharing, we log all the activity. But let's jump into a few demos. So here I'm gonna show you how to create an analysis ready data set cube, SAR data. So we have a whole time series of SAR data over time from beginning of this year to about now. And we're going to stack this with time as a dimension and also using time traveling in TileDB. So let me run all these cells now. So I'm going to walk through this. Your slide is a little bit heavy on technical detail. And then we'll get into more visualization demos and machine learning demos and show you actually how we classify the SAR data. So I import the modules I need. We have geocoded lips, so I created GEC images, SAR images. You can see I, I just list them all here. 
who are about six. We do a quick inspection of the images and we see that within the image, a single image, we have a whole bunch of metadata. So we have area or point, which is a TIFF tag, date time, image description, and then the software is used to create it. This is a huge amount of metadata, so I'm just showing you the keys in this case. We'll actually see the metadata in a second. So you can see I just ran this notebook. We're going to clean up the previous runs. And we're going to use a tool inside GDAO called BRT. And this is the way we're going to do it with time as a dimension. And then I'll show you how we do it with TileDB and write directly to a timestamp. So here we're going to copy over the band metadata. So we're stacking the individual input style images. We're taking the metadata and we're adding them for every single slice and on the time dimension. We open the VRT and we add that there. Now if I want to create the array, this is the GDAO command I'd use. So you can see we specify quite a large block size of so 1024. We're going to compress using C standard and we set the compression level. Now I load the data from the array using our integration into Rust area. So this is the tile to be array here. We print the keys. Again, I'm just going to show you the keys on the whole metadata, date time, and the description. And now we're going to create an array using TileDB timestamps, so our time tracking feature. So we create an empty array using GDAO create. We set the timestamp there to be one. We set compression to be C standard and the compression level and the block size. So now we look at the array, you can see we have that all, all set up. Here's actually all the metadata you find inside that array. So you can see it's huge. That's all captured. You don't lose any metadata or any data and you convert into a tile to be array. So it's going to scroll past all of that. And then for every image in the image list, we're going to write at a timestamp. So I open the array and I specify the timestamp I want to write at. And now you can see I write the date time and the timestamp bit here. I can write it to epoch time. Let's have a look at the schema for that array. So again, we have bands. This is a tile to be array schema. We have bands, we have y, and we have x. And then we have the values. Now we're writing at timestamp, and this corresponds to a unique tile to be fragment. So here we see the six unique fragments, the timestamps for the fragments. Let's compare the file sizes. So those six style images that came in with TIFF, they're about 4.2 gigabytes. And then there's a single tile to be array, so a time series stack, they're 1.2 gigabytes in size. Let's open the array at individual timestamps, so we have that time tracking feature. So here's my first timestamp. We see there's the actual date time. And then we open another timestamp, and we see a different date time. And again, if we open a timestamp, we get all the metadata for that timestamp as well. So let's check the region. So we have quite a large stack of star images. And then we have a relatively small point cloud. Let's just see how they are in fact. So we import the modules we need. We calculate the star bounding box, and we convert that to lat long. And we do the same with the point cloud. So here you can see this is my point cloud. This is my star. And you can see we have a we have an intersection there right in the middle over the stadium. So this is how you do a basic congestion workflow. You don't want to visualize it as well, make sure you have overlapping energy. So let's move forward. And we covered LiDAR in some depth in a previous webinar, and I encourage you to look at it. It's available on our YouTube channel. I'm just going to run this one now. And we'll go over this fairly quickly, but we can always uh, come back to your questions at the end. So I just run the notebook there. I import the modules I need. We use a PDL pipeline. And you can see here, this is very Pythonic now. So we took work with Howard and his team from the PDL team and created a new Python API for PDL. And it works really well with TileDB Cloud. So you can see we read the LES file, we form a stats filter, and then we write out to a point cloud array. We now use our TileDB Python API. We open the array, and we print out the non-empty domain, and we get the domain in native coordinates. You can see the schema here, x, y, and z, and all the attributes with the different compression filters. And now we slice the data. So here, we're using our data frame indexer. So we're going to create a pandas data frame using our TileDB API. So we open the array, we're slicing in native coordinates, and we get back a data frame, XYZ, and that's the only time number. I can also do push down queries. I can just filter here for intensity. And then we can also do visualization. So here we see a static plot of the data. And now we see an interactive 3D plot of the data as well. So you just delay our point cloud over the stadium. So a frequent question comes up is, OK, so we have a tile to be array. Can we now? export that as a GeoTIFF or as a COG, for example. And yes, of course you can. So let's say run this as a notebook as well. Just take a second or two to run. So this is our TileDB array. 
This is the SAR stack. We're going to export your data as a cog. So we invoke GDAO translate inside our UDF. And then we write up back out the results. So here I go and actually execute that user defined function. You can see the results being returned. This is my resulting tier. And you can see that there's the actual cog image. And that's the UDF. So that can be invoked from another machine uh, from your desktop from, from anywhere. The task graphs, say we had hundreds of SAR scenes and we wanted to go and get the bounding box for each one of those scenes. Well, we could do that with a task graph. So here I have a task graph. I have six nodes. And then when I run that task graph, I get the end result, and that's the bounding boxes of each one of those images on that three. Okay. So moving forward, we now want to colorize that point cloud with the actual values from the SAR data. So we import the modules we need. Again, we open the point cloud array, that's a scheme again. And we set our min x, max x, and the domain in native coordinates here and the point cloud coordinates. We're then going to reproject those coordinates into the same coordinate reference system as the SAR image. We have a look at the data frame here. And we have a look at the point cloud. So we, we actually removed the RGB from this point cloud. So you can see all the delight cloud and the point cloud, um, RGB values. And we're going to update the values of the RGB, the point cloud array of the SAR data values. And um, again, we're using our Python API to be now here. So we open uh, the image, the SAR image, we put out the coordinate reference system of the image. We then create a target reader. And um, we use uh, an advanced feature here of passing in a 3D bounding box. So we actually slice the array on read. We reproject the input points. And then we apply a colorization filter. So we're actually going to colorize that point cloud. And we just did that. So we look at the metadata, see all the metadata was happening with the PDL pipeline. And now we use our data frame. So we're going to open the data frame here. So we can take the resulting NumPy array and look at the data frame. So we see here, it's the point cloud. And there's the, there's the actual SAR values, do you see? And they're on the right hand side. So we've colorized that point cloud. And we just want to do a check that we have the right values. So we take a couple of points and we inspect the SAR image. And we see we have values of 621 and 567. We look at the data frame, 621 and 567. So, so we're good with colorize the point cloud correctly. We're then going to scale the SAR and stretch the SAR intensity. So here we see how we do the, the stretch. You can see we pulled the scale factor out of the SAR metadata. So that's actually inside the metadata that comes along with the image. You can see here in the data frame, we now have scaled SAR and stretched SAR. We plot the data. You can see here the stadium. And then we do the same thing in 3D. So now we've actually put our um, SAR pixel values on top of the point cloud where previously we didn't have anything. And there are many reasons why you want to do this. Um, mainly because SAR, um, Compare Space's SAR instrument covers a very large area. And you can go and quickly colorize a whole bunch of point clouds. And also because SAR values have structure. So you can go and infer things like building information, uh, do change detection, that kind of thing. Um, op collecting optical imagery is very expensive. It would require multiple editable classes. Using it is cheaper and you get more information out of the data. Okay. So let's have a quick look at some of our advanced visualization capabilities. So we're going to run this array now. Okay, so we're actually going to visualize a SAR scene inside this widget here. So now we have a SAR scene actually inside the widget. And you can see that it's, it's lit very well and it scales nicely. You can rotate it and zoom it. And then we want to view the classification. So we're using the label data set from the from how about the OS team. We open the point cloud array, we go into a slice. You can see we have a whole bunch of classifications here in that classification column. And we print out the unique classifications. So you can see we have a bunch of them here. And the classes correspond to ground, vegetation, building, um, cars, that kind of thing. So we're going to filter for all the cars. So here we filter for all classification values are equal to 65. And now we can see all the cars in that scene. We can zoom it out. And then we're going to do the same thing for buildings.
So you can see all the buildings within that scene here. So one of the main motivations for today's webinar is, hey, we have a whole bunch of star scenes and we have this beautiful label point cloud data set and point clouds are you know, in abundance out there. How can we go and create a machine learning model that can go and infer values for star data? So we could say that this is a building, this is a car, this is a tree, that kind of thing. <coughs> so we import the models we need. One second, please. And we're going to use the Psyche image um, platform. And here are our two TileDB arrays. And we're going to clip these images, your star stack to the area around the stadium. So here you can see we specify our uh, X and Y and Z. You're going to transform this into the coordinate system of the star stack. And now we're going to do a co-registration. So we slice the image here from the bounds. We create a stack, you can see the stack's created. And now we do an optical flow registration. So because this is GAC scenes, they're pretty well registered already. This is just a final step that you might wanna do. We now grid the data. We're gonna work the attributes from the point cloud of intensity uh, with green and blue classification. We open the array. And we're gonna create the independent variables we need for this machine learning task. We then stack, stack the array. This is just a bunch of debug to make sure that our scenes are correctly aligned. We have a classification dependent variable. We're gonna limit this to a thousand because it's a demo. We want it to run fairly quickly. Again, these are our classes. We're gonna do an A logistic regression classifier. So we import the models we need. We see our classifier there. Again, we're gonna reduce the sample size for the demo. We're going to fit the classification on the dependent variable. And then we're going to say, let's do a prediction on what is our accuracy score. So you can see using that um, point cloud um, data set, using the SAR scenes that we have available, we have an accuracy score of about 0.75, which is pretty good. So that means going forward, we can predict classification variables within SAR scenes. So we have about uh, 15 minutes left of this webinar. I'd just like to open it up now for Q&A. Thank you, Norman. Also, I would like to mention that all those notebooks, because we went through them quickly, we just wanted to give you a good taste of all the capabilities that um, uh, that you can you can have on on, on Talibi Cloud around SAR and, and LiDAR data. We're going to make all of those notebooks available. You're going to get a link to a recording plus a, you know, a summary blog post where we will have all the links to, to those notebooks. So we have some uh, some great questions that I would like to, to answer um, online. Um, I'll start. I'll start with a couple, and then I'm going to hand over to Norman and uh, Jason, the the ones that are relevant to them. Um, so there are two questions that are kind of re relevant because they have to do about the the actual format and indexing on TileDB. So one uh, asks about how uh, how is the spatial indexing across multiple dimensions and across geolocated different data types handled, and the second is are the files for each tile label differently. So I understand that there is a little bit of a, of a confusion here. So let me let me explain how this works very briefly on the sparse side. And we have a, you know, a full-fledged uh, webinar and, and blog post as well as docs about specifically the format so that if you have more questions or if you want to dig deeper later, just go on our website and you can find all of that there. So here's how points um, of any kind could be 2D, 3D, AIS and, and, and LiDAR are kind of the same. So this is how we get them ingested into TalDB. We get the data, we populate buffers, one per dimension, right? The coordinates of each dimension and one per every field. So TalDB is a columnar format, right? You have for intensity, R, G, B, these are different buffers, different columns. We take the data based on the buffering could be, for example, a gigabyte, two gigabytes, it doesn't matter. Based on this buffering, we sort the data usually using Hilbert. You have other options as well, but I want to make it easy. We sort all of this data based on Hilbert, and then we cut those into multiple tiles. Each tile is not a separate file. We have one file per attribute and a set of files per a batch write. If you write 10 gigs, you're going to have a set of, uh, a single set for all of the coordinates and attributes that fit in these 10 gigs. 
okay? That it's a columnar format. Think of parquet, for example. But now you have the ordering. You we cut the tiles based on the capacity. Let's say hundred thousand. Then we compress each of the tiles, and then we flush them into the disk in parallel, right? And then on top for every tile, we create the bounding box, and then we, those bounding boxes are already sorted on Hilbert. And then we build a tree on top of those, and that's the R tree. And the R tree goes in a separate file, which is the metadata file. And that, and all of that goes in a subfolder of the array, which is time stamped because you can time travel on it. Now, if you write again, that's a different subfolder of a similar structure. If you write again another subfolder, and then we have a lot of merging around, you know, collapsing some of the small metadata in single file so that it's it's cloud native performance is is much better so a lot of other details but there's no such thing as a file per tile so there is just the array and you know multiple tiles may be stored in a single file and also that's how that, that's how multi multi-dimensional indexing is handled in this particular case it's our trees uh if there are any questions uh, uh, after my explanation please write it on the chat and i'm going to pick it up so that's one. Now, another extremely important question is about compression. So in our quick test of TileDB, we found a 5x increase in data volume compared to LAS or uh, EPT for LiDAR. Yes, we, we understand. So there are two issues here. Number one, the default compressors are not selected appropriately, and we're changing this in the next version of PDAW. Uh, we're missing good compressors for RGB. And we're missing good compressor for XYZ. So imagine that XYZ and RGB six fields are not compressed. You can choose the compressor for every one of those fields through the parameters you give to um, to PDAL when you create the pipeline. We can help with that. Just contact us, and we can help you with with an appropriate configuration for the compressors. But even with those compressors, we we have seen that TALDB is about 2.5 times larger than LAS, like even after carefully selecting the compressors. Here's why, GPS time. So GPS time is double and uh, it's not sorted in TALDB. In, TAL, in LAS, it is sorted. All the points are sorted on GPS time. In TALDB, we sort on XYZ because we want to support slicing on XYZ, which is the majority of the workloads faster than anything we do with GPS time, right? GPS time is an attribute. You can put extra conditions, but that's an attribute. Of course, you can make it a dimension, but still, if you order on Hilbert, you don't strictly order only on GPS time. So what I did actually over the past weekend, I was just playing around because that annoyed me, the fact that GPS time does not compress well entirely. We can see a, a 2x compression, just that field, because again, it's columnar, so all the GPS time values go in a separate file. And I, I noticed about 2x when using BZIP2, which is a strong compressor, or even Z standard. And I wasn't happy with that. So I did the following experiment. I sorted on GPS time. I took the pairwise XORs of all the values. And then I compressed that with BZIP2. And what I saw is the 10x compression. So what we're doing right now is that for every tile, we're introducing a new filter. And that's the benefit of having a storage engine like TileDB. You don't reinvent everything around indexing and slicing and parallel IO and all of that just because you need to change your compressor. All we need to do is change the compressor. So what we're doing is we're introducing a new filter, which is going to sort the XYZ plus GPS time and only, only that on GPS time, take the pairwise XORs for the GPS time XYZ compress already very well, and then compress those. We don't need to have, you know, uh, relative positions stored uh, separately because we have the XYZs. And then when we, when we decompress, we do the reverse. And then we sort back to the original order because we know the order. We have X, Y, Z, so and we know what the user set as the order. So that's going to give us a 10x compression uh, ratio for uh, for GPS time, and we believe that we can match the last compression. Okay, so um, next one. So that's for Norman. Uh, why are some calls to GDAL made through the console instead of the Python bindings? Um, so that was just for convenience in this case. Um, the Python bindings are fully there, both uh, the GDAL Python bindings and the REST area bindings. It's just when you're doing a GDAL info call, it's just a command thing call, it's very quick to do. Excellent. Um, Norman, probably you should take the next one as well. Can TileDB data um, rapidly visualize large raster data similar to a cog? 
or LIDAR, similar to EPT via a cloud link. I'm assuming, you know, interactive, interactive visualization, zooming in, zooming out and panning and panning so that you get inter interactive, interactive visualization. Yeah, so we do have interactive visualizations through, uh, through like Mapbox vector tiles. So we have a vector tile server. Uh, for things like uh, tile server for 3D data or point clouds, that's actually on our roadmap and we'll have that done towards the end of Q2. Yeah, just to, to mention a couple of, uh, of more things here, you, you're going to see some more integrations with, let's say, popular tools I'm, we're going to disclose soon. Um, but the idea is that since TileDB is cloud native, it has very small, very small footprint. When you open the array, you get, you get back from the cloud some metadata, like VR trees, non-empty domains, you get very, very small information from the cloud just in, in, in an instant, like just opening the array. And from that point onwards, you can navigate pretty much on any slice in space rapidly. It's, it's an artifact of the, of the cloud native format. So yes, we can. The, what we are missing is this integration with the visualizers because the visualizers are what allow the user to to engage with the, with, with the viewer and send the commands to TalDB. So yes, and actually it's pretty interactive even on S3. So it's very, very fast. Okay, uh, another question, um, which SAR data sets are accessible on TalDB Cloud and which via the Capella co console? This is, this is definitely a question for, uh, for Jason. Um, just a small note here, TalDB Cloud, you can just, act, if you go to TalDB Cloud, um, at, cloud.talib.com, you can see um, public data sets. You don't even need to be signed up, uh, signed up uh, and, uh, and logged in. And you can see the notebooks and everything. So everything we're going to share with you, you don't even need to have an account. You need an account if you want to slice interactively and so on and so forth, right? So uh, uh, Capella Space was super nice uh, to register some of the public data sets there, but I will leave uh, Jason explain a little bit what is public there, what you can find on Capella Space and what you can, you can find on Talibi Cloud in the future. Thanks, Stavros. Yeah, so um, as Stavros mentioned, we have a um, about an 80 scene set, um, plus or minus maybe like 80 to 85 uh, scenes available on uh, TileDB. And um, out in the console, we have several thousand scenes. We're, we're currently building our archive um, but uh, yeah, it's just a subset on the TileDB uh, cloud right now. I think I could probably take the, the ellipsoid geocoded question too there. So it says, uh, if SAR images are only ellipsoid geocoded GEC products, as we showed you today, then their geolocation would, would not correspond to the point cloud. Um, one would need to perform terrain geocoding for that. Is terrain geocoding also available as an example? So yes, I mentioned um, that they, we have um, uh, 80 scenes. They come in different formats. Um, we have SLC, which is um, single look complex. We have GEC, um, and then also what's called GEO, we, what we call GEO, and that is the uh, terrain corrected um, product. So you're, you're strict, strictly speaking, you're right, um, and you could probably see a little bit of that where the, um, the layover from the SAR image didn't match exactly the point cloud in the stands. Um, we did it for simplicity, um, but uh, uh, we do have those geocoded products as well. Great, um, another question. Um, um, is there a way to store generic metadata for an entire TileDB data set for things like CRS, or other custom info. I, I can speak to the generic part of it, and then maybe Norman can can speak about an, an example. So yes, TalDB. If you saw the the slide I shared about the schema, you can attach any generic key value pair to the array itself, so that you can have metadata that go beyond the data that you're uh, uh, that you're storing into TalDB. And actually, the, the the next question was also relevant: Is it possible to search arrays on metadata? And I'm assuming like metadata like this. And the answer is yes. So once you register the data on TalDB Cloud, TalDB Cloud uh, syncs with, with the metadata stored in the self-contained format on S3. And now you can search on millions of arrays based on this metadata. And you're gonna get back interactively the list of, of arrays. And of course, uh, everything is accessible programmatically as well. So everything that Norma showed you on the console, everything is accessible through APIs. 
Uh, Norman, I don't know if you had any uh, anything to chime in about, you know, generic metadata, perhaps an example of what you're storing in, in Tally BRAs. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. So in addition to the generic metadata, which you can store anything you want, as Stefan was saying, you can also store the CRS information. You can do that in a GDAO and PDAO way. So it's read by those tools. And it's brought up, back up into the system through Lasteria or GDAO. So things like for both of those data sets had different coordinate reference systems and both of those, those coordinate reference systems were stored in that array metadata. Excellent. We have two more questions. Uh, then we'll see if anything else comes up. Um, what type of support is there for including other data sets like from Google Earth Engine, uh, for example, maybe Sentinel-2 or 3 or VIIRS, or maybe Modis uh, data on Landsat, et cetera? No yeah, I can take that one, Stefan. Yeah, thank you. That's actually a great question. So it's great that you mentioned VIRS, VIIRS, because our last webinar was with, um, with Spire and they had ship location data. And that's, that's exactly what we showed. So we showed the nighttime lights data set, which is VIRS, and we harmonize that with the IIS data set and we're ready to do dark ship detection. So we can really store any uh, 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 geospatial data set you can think of as a tile to be a way. Excellent. Maybe also the next one, uh, Norman, uh, any support for vector data overlays to D3D and ability to query? Uh, perhaps we can tell them about our plans there. Um, yes, definitely. So that's um, on our, our roadmap and we'll be doing that within the next few weeks. So we'll be storing complex geometries inside tile to be arrays and then we're allowed you to do spatial queries. So you better do within contains, overlays, all the standard spatial functions directly against the tile to be array. Awesome. Um, I think we did a very good job in terms of time. I don't see any other question. Um, let's give it a couple of, uh, a few more seconds to see if, if anything else comes up. Hey, I think uh, I think we're good. Um, big thanks to uh, to Jason Norman and his team uh, for for putting this together, and big thanks uh, for for the audience and the questions. Um, we we're super accessible. Just send us an email if you have any questions. Very happy to to show you more demos and more workshops. And we're looking forward to your feedback. Um, uh, we we want to see what we can do, what we can, what we do well, what we don't do well, and how to improve. So uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for attending.